sit there and be quiet and not say, Amen. Yes, he is. Hallelujah. Yes, he is. Because oh, he is everything. <laughs> and it's beyond everything we could possibly imagine today. <laughs> what is worship? What is worship? It is part three of our message. It is the desperate dependence we must have on the Holy Spirit of God. We are not able of our own. Apostle Paul was talking in Philippians about that in his Galatians as well. But in Philippians 3.3, 3, he says we are the circumcision. In other words, we are the real changed people. We're the real believers. Not just outwardly, but in our hearts. He says, which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no, how much? No confidence in the flesh. May God bless His holy word. How many of us have confidence in the flesh? How many of us live as though we're able to take care of everything in our own lives? Now we don't say that, but do we live that way? How many of you have ever been in a car before, John? And you, keep, you hear a noise. What is that? What is that noise? Something's wrong. And you say to yourself, I'll just keep on going and hopefully it'll quit. Have you ever done something like that? Hopefully it'll quit. Maybe it's nothing. Because you don't want to go and have somebody have to work on it. You have to pay for it for one thing. So you just, I'm going to hope it'll go away. Many of us live that way. We just hope things are going to get better, but we don't ever take any steps to get them done. Or maybe you do take a step sometimes. Maybe you do try. How many of you set New Year's resolutions? How many of you have kept your New Year's resolutions so far this year? How many of you said you're going to do something and you've done it and you follow through? Let's be honest, we all fall no matter how hard we try. And sometimes, you know, I just, sometimes I want to do it just to prove to myself that I can. Have you ever done that? I'm going to prove to myself I can do this. So the other day I went home, went into the kitchen, I pulled open the drawer, I pulled out the big bag of Lay's potato chip, and I just ate one. <laughs> I put the bag back in the drawer. They were wrong. <laughs> I could eat only one. How many of you guys, I said guys because it's mostly men, how many of you get sick? And your wife or your friend says, go to the doctor. No, I'll be all right. I'll take care of it. We're in bend in our way. We have that independent mindset. But it's the same in worship. The question comes back again. If the Holy Spirit stopped empowering our worship, would anybody notice? Would anybody notice? Some people see the Holy Spirit as a good thing. It's there. But it's, it's sort of like, Brother Judy, it's sort of like your picnics. <laughs> we don't know why it's there. We don't really know what it does. And if it's not there, it won't matter. That's how many look at the work of the Holy Spirit today. How many of you ever read children's stories? I'm sure parents, grandparents, you probably see a lot of children's stories or read them. Uh, and you learn a lot about this. I love children's stories. As a matter of fact, that's about all I read. It's children and preteen stories because you don't find all the violence and smut and everything else. You might find in some other stuff. And I come away blessed reading them. But I'm going to tell you one of the best ones I've read by Arnold Lobel, The Frog and the Toad. Some of you know what I'm talking about, The Frog and the Toad. You remember that story? The frog makes uh, some cookies, I believe it is, to give to the toad. And they're sitting there eating, and they can't stop eating. Them. They just find out they're gorging them. So they, they decide, we can't just sit here and eat all these cookies. That's not good. So the whole story is about ways they try not to eat the cookies. They put them in a box. They wrapped a, a ribbon around it, tied it so they wouldn't have to be tempted. They put it up high on the shelf where they couldn't reach it. But every time, they could always get back into it. And finally... They decide they're just going to give them and throw them out to the birds. So that's what they do. And as the story ends, 
their, their thinking, how they felt about themselves and their willpower, and how they were able to overcome the temptation. And they were kind of proud of themselves until, until the Toad said, Brock, where are you going? And he said, I'm, I'm going to go home and bake a cake. <laughs> That's how we deal with willpower. It sounds so good. <coughs> And willpower is a good thing as long as it's not just coming from us. Because if it is, we're not going to succeed. There are three persons in the Holy Trinity and all of them are vital in worship. Listen to what Paul said to the Ephesians. Listen for God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in this passage. Verse 14 of Ephesians 3. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto Him that is able to do abundantly, exceeding abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Unto Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus Throughout all the ages, world without end. Amen. Do you see the Holy Spirit, God the Son, God the Father, repeatedly in that passage? We're not going to have worship without all three of them. Because God is the triune God who manifests Himself. He is a Spirit. And those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. But I want you to look at that scripture in Ephesians. And what does it teach us about the role of the Holy Spirit? What does that passage teach us about the involvement of the Holy Spirit in our worship today? Well, first of all, that scripture says, He gives us mighty strength. Strength of might. Deep within inside us. <clears throat> Notice what it says again. That He would grant you according to the riches of His glory. In other words, it's an endless supply. He'll grant you to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. I scratched my head and I thought, inner man, what's He talking about? He is not talking about our sinful nature. He's talking to believers here. There is a sinful nature, but these believers have been saved. They have a spiritual nature. And that is the inner man He's talking to. He's talking about the born-again Christian who has that inner power within him that wars against the flesh. And we are strengthened. As somebody once said, I think, it, uh, as, I think they probably read The Frog and the Toad. But they said this, Unless desires are transformed, Willpower will only restrain us for a short period of time. You can be determined to do something and you can do it well for a short period of time. But you're not going to be able just to eat one lay's potato chip. You're eventually going to go back and get another one. That's willpower. It's not sufficient in ourselves. That's why we must be strengthened with God's might and power. And what is His power? The last verse Last couple verses tell us that in this passage I just read, according to the power worketh in us. I want you to know today that when we come to worship, we don't want to stand there with our hands in our pockets. There's some things that are absolutely necessary to have spiritual worship. And one of them is that we cannot trust in our own ability. Our own willpower to do something. We must come acknowledging there is a power. And that power gives us the strength. And the ability to be able to worship. That we cannot do it of ourselves. But there's another thing that not only is there this incredible power. 
But there's also a, a need, a, a, an absolute need for passion. Passion. You know, you see it everywhere you go in life. You see it everywhere you go in life. Someone that gets real emotional and cries when they watch a romantic movie on TV. Or someone who gets excited and screams and yells at a ball game. There's passion. We all have passion for something. And if we don't have passion for worship, then we won't come ready to worship. We won't come prepared to worship. We won't get passionate about God. We'll do our thing. Holy Spirit here or not, it doesn't matter. And we'll go on without a drive and a passion for the power of God in our lives. And secondly, he says here, here's what the Holy Spirit does. And he did it to me. And he's done it to most of you. He gives us faith to receive Christ in our hearts. Isn't that good? Amen. Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That you be rooted and grounded in love. Let me tell you the Holy Spirit, what He did for me. He drew me. The Holy Spirit showed me Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit revealed to me that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. The Holy Spirit let me know and, and reinforced in me that I do not have the ability to, pay, to, to save myself. That my willpower to try to look good isn't enough. The Holy Spirit convicted me of my sin. Showed me where I fell short of God's glory. The Holy Spirit took the scales off of my eyes. I was blinded and I could not see God. I could not experience God in worship because I was lost and completely undone. And the Holy Spirit said, you need Jesus Christ in your life. And you know what? I'm so glad my eyes were open. And I was able to see and I was able to pray and, and say, Lord, forgive me for being a sinner. I'm sorry. I know I can't save myself. I, I can't be good enough. But, but I've just heard this incredible story how you sent Jesus to die for me. I guess I'd heard it before. I just, it just never sunk in before. Until that pastor was there and the Holy Spirit was working, I began to realize it. Jesus died for me. He gave his life for me. So that I believe in Him, I have eternal life. He came because He wants me to have a purpose and a plan in life. And wow, it was exciting to hear all that. And the pastor said, would you like to pray and receive Christ? And I did. Hallelujah. I just prayed it as simply as I knew how. Because I don't guess I'd ever prayed before. Lord, forgive me. Come into my heart and save me. It was that simple. And you wonder, well, why do people not do that today? Why do people not call on Jesus why do people not obey God and publicly profess Him as Lord and Savior? John tells us that wonderful chapter 3 of John. It's an incredible chapter. Everybody knows John 3.16. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him goes right along with point 2, doesn't it? That we would receive Christ by faith in our hearts. Whoever believes in Him will not perish. But have everlasting life. And God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. But that the world through Him might be saved. But don't stop there. Go on down. Look at verse 19. And this is the condemnation. That light is come into the world. And here's why people don't see Jesus. Here's why people don't trust Jesus. Here's why people do not confess Jesus. John says it in Jesus' words actually. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. That's a roundabout way of saying, I can take care of all this myself. I don't need anybody to tell me what to do. I don't need any intervention in my life. And I know how I'm living. I know what I'm doing. Stay out of my life. I'm going to keep on living the way I want to live. And John, through Jesus' work, says that is the condemnation. That's what condemns you. Your self-sufficiency that you don't need God in your life. He says in verse 20, Everyone that does evil hates the light. Neither comes to the light. Lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth comes to the light. 
I like that. Comes to the light. No, I didn't do anything to come to the light. The Lord brought me. He showed me. But you know what I had to do? What, what, what Paul says right here in Ephesians. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. You know what the Holy Spirit does? He gives you the ability to believe. He gives you a measure of faith to be able to trust Him as Lord and Savior. If you're saved today, you're saved, first of all, because Christ made the way. In God's love, He sent Christ. But the Holy Spirit showed you. He revealed to you. He gave you the ability to understand it and to know and to be drawn to Him. John said, and wrote in Jesus' words again in John chapter 7, Verses 38 and 39. Listen to what he said. He that believes on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. What's he talking about? Who is he talking about? Who is that living water? The Holy Spirit. Because the very next sentence says, but this he spoke of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, because it was before Pentecost. The Holy Spirit had to be received yet. So when I got saved, I had the ability to believe and receive Jesus Christ in my life. And then somebody indwelled me. Christ, through the Holy Spirit, lives within me and indwells me. And that is made no clearer than in the very next point that he gives us here in this passage. He tells us, number three, that we can have the capacity. He gives us the capacity to know the extent of Christ's love. Isn't that good news today? That the Holy Spirit, though we are sinners, we're lost, we're undone, we're separated and alienated from God, we cannot begin to grasp truth, but the Holy Spirit reveals to us, verse 18, that you might be able to comprehend. That means grasp it, get it. I finally get it. I finally understand it. I can comprehend with all true believers, with all the saints, what is the breadth and length and depth and height. And to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. Passes knowledge. Do you hear that? You don't have the knowledge or the ability to learn it on your own. You cannot come into worship apart from the Holy Spirit and learn anything. If His power is not here, you've just come to a social event. If you don't know Christ and have the Holy Spirit speaking to you, you've just come to a social event. You've not engaged in worship. Worship is listening to the Holy Spirit of God as He speaks to us. And He says, and I go back to my point again about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that He gives us the capacity to know the extent of God's love. Notice how he says it. The breadth, the length, the depth, the height. The first thing that came to my mind as I read that. It leaped off the paper of the Bible at me. And this was it. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. When the prophets, the Old Testament prophets like Ezekiel and others were given measuring sticks and told to go measure. When John measures heaven, the new Jerusalem in Revelation, they're always measuring a temple or a place of dwelling. And so I'm thinking, I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. So for me to be able to grasp the far extent of Christ's love, that means... It has to be from the very depths of my soul to the very heights of my soul and from one extreme to the other of my soul. For me to be a true, genuine follower of Christ, it must be all of the temple, not a part of it, not a section of it, but all the temple, as far as my soul can measure, I'm to know and understand and grasp the love of Jesus Christ. John 14, Jesus prophesied, he told about the coming of another comforter. And then he goes on in the very next verse, verse uh, chapter 14, verse 17. And he says, you will know him. You will know him. And how will you know him? For he dwells within you. That's what Jesus said. 
How will you know the Holy Spirit? Because He fills up your temple. From the top to the depths to the far extremes. All the measurements He fills. And who enables us to know and understand that? Who gives us the capacity? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enables us to grasp the love of Christ. You know what it means to know? The word gnosko, one of the first words I learned studying Greek. Means to know like an intimate knowledge. Is the same word used every time someone knew their spouse and conceived. That was the very word. It was the most intimate knowledge that conceives. And so when you know Christ, it's as though it takes root in you and it's an intimate. And you conceive, you have a development of the knowledge of God's love through Jesus Christ. Jesus you know what Jesus did? And he said it in his own words, but it applied to him. He said, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Yeah, There's no greater love. Can you understand the capacity of God's love in your temple from the depths to the, to the heights, to the far extremes? There is no greater love that can fill your soul than the love of Christ. Because there is no greater love than that and the scripture goes on to say, you know, someone might die for a good person, but nobody's going to die for a bad person. But, Jesus, but God commended his love toward us in that even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't give his life for someone that had done a favor for him. He gave his life for someone who was his enemy, who hated him, who loved the darkness rather than the light. That was me. And he gave his life for that's the incredible, immense love of God we can never, ever grasp without the Holy Spirit teaching that to us. And then he says, fourthly, he says, and that we will also be filled, that he would fill us up with the fullness of God. Think again of that wonderful temple. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That is such an incredible thought. Think about it for a moment. If that was not true, if there were no Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit did not indwell you, do you know what would happen to you? You would have to go to a certain place somewhere in the world where you could meet God. Whether it be a temple or a mountain or somewhere that God designated for you to go worship Him. That's what He told the, the children of Israel. And that would be you today. And furthermore, you would have to be laboring ferociously to keep certain laws and make sacrifices like these uh, lambs on the front of your, the sheep and lamb on the front of your program today. And we'd be trying our hardest to try to measure up to God. But instead, when you get saved by the sacrifice of Christ, you have this soul capacity to grasp His love and you can now be filled up with the fullness of God. You know, the scripture says be filled Amen. with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Do you know what that is? That is a command. That is, that is not something that certain people get. Every believer ought to be filled with the fullness of God. Every believer should have empowered living when they come to worship. Every believer should have a passion for God when we come to worship. Every believer should be filled to our capacity with the divine wisdom of God, the divine knowledge of God, the divine love of God. We come to church and we miss the fullness of God. We miss God altogether. We come and we miss the capacity to grasp Christ's love. We haven't worshipped. We cannot worship apart from the revealing of truth. Through the Holy Spirit of God. Ephesians 2.18 For through Him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. Amen. That's worship now. Jesus gave us access to the Father through the shed blood on the cross of Jesus. But we have access to God now through the Spirit to pray and to worship Him and to be in power for living. And if we don't have the Holy Spirit... We don't have that access. 2 Corinthians 3, 16 through verse 18. Now the Lord is that spirit. 
And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. We are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. It is the Spirit who transforms you. It is the Spirit who awakens you. It's the Spirit who gives you empowerment to live your life. If we're not living the abundant Christian life, then perhaps we quench the work of the Holy Spirit if we're truly saved. If we're truly saved. Romans 8.28 tells us, 8.26 through 28 actually, what the Holy Spirit does. Do you know what He does? Here's just a few things. He helps our infirmities. He makes intercession for us. That passage says He searches our hearts. Yes. He makes us to know and understand the mind of God. And then it says He makes intercession for us according to to the will of God. He gives us direction to stay in God's will for our lives. And that's when you come to verse 28. So many people misquote that and take it out of context. That all things will work together for the good. No, they won't. They won't, but they work together for the good to those who are loving God, first of all. To them that love God and then to those that are called According to his purpose, which the previous verse says, the Holy Spirit is the one who tells us and intercedes for us so that we will know the mind and the will of God. So everything will not work out for good in your life if you just go around with the attitude. Whatever happens, happens. It'll be bad, I promise you. The good comes only when God gives you the wisdom and knowledge to take the situation and show you how good can come out of it. And then lastly here, <clears throat> Goes back to the power he talks about in that verse again. In verse 20. He empowers you and me in worship. And every day of life. He empowers us to do more than we could ever imagine. Could ever imagine. In other words, he gives us a wider range. And you know what? We, we don't take advantage of the wider range, do we? I read a study one time on prayer, and the, the two most often prayed prayers, as a matter of fact, they're not just number one and two, they are predominantly one and two. Nothing comes close to them. They're the two that we pray all the time. <laughs> one is we pray for sick people, which we ought to, but that's all we do sometimes. And then secondly, we ask God for help when we get in trouble properly. Those are the two prayers. Are we praying to the God who can do more than we can ever imagine? Do we come to worship and think, you know what, I have a burden for this community. I'm going to pray that God will bring this church and fill it up. I watched a show on TV, today, a church today on TV, and they had a praise group standing up front, about six or eight of them. The director was leading them. And they showed about half of the church building on the camera. There was two sections in the church. It went back several rows. And you know how many people were in church? And that's two in each section. There were four people in that church I could see. And I saw about ten rows deep in both sections. We're blessed that God has filled us up. But God says, don't be satisfied. Don't just say I'm content just to pray for sick people. What about your Sunday school? Are you praying that God would fill it up? For some of our classes, if they came, there'd be nowhere for them. Because they're already filled. So do we really want people to come? No, we don't. Or we wouldn't have a jam-packed classroom where there's no room for anybody else to come if we really care about the loss. Do we really pray expectantly for people? Are we really looking for God to do great things? Are we praying passionately for God to send a great awakening? Here in these mountains, it's more than you can ever imagine. Don't just be satisfied with praying for sick people. Look at our bulletin. That's all that's on there. That's all that's ever on there. It's just sick people. We never ask God for anything else, do we? Because we've limited our range. We don't ask for the far beyond you can ever hope or imagine. But that's what God said He wants to do. God is saying, if it can't be done, and you don't have the money to do it, you don't have the sufficiency to do it, 
then I'll do it. Trust me with it. Trust me to accomplish great things. This church has had a great vision. They, they had a vision to plant mission churches all over this county. They dreamed outside of the box, didn't they? What is our ambition? What are we praying for outside of the box today? That God might do in His incredible power. In 2 Corinthians 3, it talks about how there's the written law with ink and then there's the spirit of the living God and how they're so different. Sometimes we get caught up in the rules and the regulations and the policies and the procedures. We, we're stuck on the letter of the law, but there is no liberty in that. The liberty is those that have the Spirit of God. Where the Spirit is, there is liberty. And, and he goes on in 2 Corinthians 3. And he says, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Don't you think we ought to ask for something a whole lot more than we do? Don't you think we ought to be pursuing God passionately with a brokenness of spirit? Pouring our hearts out for God to do what we cannot do. What is impossible for us to do. What seems hopeless to get done. But we're going to pray for it because we know a God. Who can do anything above whatever we can imagine. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then that last verse just closes it out. It talks about the range of God's power. Look what it says. The last verse. Unto Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. In other words, God's theater, our capacity is here. God's capacity, there is none. It's the church, it's the universe, it's the world, it's the ages, past, present, and future. Without end is God's theater where He works. If that's true, why aren't we asking Him for more? Why aren't we asking for God to do something great? And pursuing it passionately. I go back as we go to the invitation now. I'll summarize this one more time. Here's what we need. We're going to worship God. And we're going to worship Him in the Spirit. And we're going to trust Him in the Holy Spirit. Here's what we need today as we move to the invitation. We must have a desperate dependence on God. We've got to stop thinking we're okay. And we can handle it ourselves. We've got to come broken before God and say, I'm desperate without your Holy Spirit. I can do nothing. But with Christ, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And if we don't come to that desperate dependence on God, we'll not prepare before we come to church. How many of us prayed passionately before we came to church this morning that God would pour His Spirit out and empower our worship? Be honest with yourself. How many of us came prepared that God was going to do something great? And so we need desperate dependence and then we need eager expectation. It's one thing to know God can act. It is another thing entirely to expect Him to act. And I believe everybody in here knows God can act. But I'd say very few came to church this morning expecting God to do anything. Because we've already planned what time we're leaving and where we're going. As though God was not expected to even be here today. And then thirdly, we need an humble responsiveness to God. Some people say, do you do anything special at church day? No, it's just a normal service. There's no such thing as a normal service. Amen. When the Holy Spirit of God is here, that's supernatural. Amen. Every day is special when we worship. And we've got to come not expecting the routine or the normal, but rather for God to do something. And today's moving right now in this invitation. Today's speaking to someone's heart. What are you waiting on? You're going to keep on setting your own resolutions. You're going to keep on trying in your own power. Are you finally going to humbly submit to God and say yes to Him today? And let Him take over and do extraordinary things in your life. Would you bow your heads with me? I want to read. One verse I was reading through Jeremiah last night. I already had it marked from another time, but I saw this verse. And I thought, that is such a great verse. I believe the Holy Spirit led me to share this verse today for our invitation. It's Jeremiah 7, verse 13. God's speaking to His people now who were rebelling against Him. Here's what He said. 
God said, I spoke unto you, rising up early and speaking, but you did not hear. And I called you, but you did not answer. Boy, that just spoke to my heart because today God is speaking to somebody. Somebody right now. But aren't you hearing it? Are you hearing what he's saying to you? God says, I called you, but you didn't answer. Maybe you heard God today, but you're not going to answer. Do you hear him speaking to you through the Holy Spirit today? He's drawing you. He's telling you the wonderful things that can happen in your life. You follow him with all your heart. You can know the capacity and extent of Christ's love. You can be filled with the fullness of God. You can pray for God to do above and beyond anything you can even imagine. He'll give you strength deep within. And listen, He'll give you the faith today to receive Christ in your heart. If you listen to the Holy Spirit, if you answer Him, I spoke unto you rising up early and speaking, but you heard not. And I called you, but you answered not. Father in heaven, open our ears and our hearts. Let us be sensitive to the work and the speaking of the Holy Spirit in our hearts today as He shows us Christ, who loves us, who died for us, who wants us to grasp the extent of that wonderful love who wants us to know Him intimately, to be filled up with God, to be able to experience the power of the Holy Spirit within us today so that we can do what cannot even be imagined in our lives right now if we would just trust You and publicly declare You and take a stand for Jesus today. So move in our invitation. Let somebody hear You, Lord. Let all of us hear You. Let all of us answer you. Let us answer you with a yes today. Whatever you're calling us to do. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I know God has spoken. You come today. You come today. Answer him. Whatever it is he's calling you to do. As we stand, may we all stand as we sing. Hymn number three.